Welcome to Friday Hacks 217, and I hope everyone had a great week so far. So we have two speakers as usual today. So the first speaker will be Ying Hang, and he'll be talking about how to build a dev to startup in Silicon Valley. So Ying Hang is a Stanford alumnus and founding engineer at Tim, a startup that is building a browser-based code editor that is designed for collaboration and can easily integrate with existing infrastructure. So let's welcome him. Yeah, so today I'll be um, giving a talk about how to build a dev to startup in Silicon Valley. And my name is Ying Hang. So um, yeah, so the first slide, so it's a little bit of background about me is that I'm actually studying NJC um, before and in, in, in JC basically back in Singapore. And then after that, I went to Stanford to do my undergrad. So I did undergrad in computer science and management science and engineering. And right after graduating, then that's when I uh, started this company called Time. Oh, actually I joined as a founding engineer. So I guess the first question is like, what is Time? So Time is basically a startup. And then in this startup, we are trying to build a multiplayer in browser editor that lets you code at any machine. And you can check it out on time.so. Um, but, and we started working on this uh, startup in June, 2021. So it was just like about seven, eight months ago. So I, I think it will be best for me to kind of, like, I think it will be easiest for me to kind of show what's, what's time by like doing a little quick demo. So let me just exit out. And so this is what we've been so far, time. Okay, this is the landing page. Um, so let me just log in. So basically it's a multiplayer editor that lets me kind of just code on any machine that we want. So let's say I have this, this is my computer that's live right now. So I can just kind of jump into it and then I open this link and then right, boom, it's like a full fledged VS code that has everything that's kind of running. I, I have terminal access, I can open the code. And the cool thing is like, I can just open, copy this link uh, let me just share to another person. Like for example, I share to my friend. Oops, uh, that's because I didn't turn on the permissions. Let me set the permissions. Re access, add access. So I copy this thing, kind of share it over here. And then someone else like will be able to edit the code together with me in person. So you can see that's like a, I can see my cursor there and then they can see the cursor kind of right here. Yeah, so this is on high level kind of what we have built so far. Um, but I can, I will go into more details about like, what is the vision of what we're making uh, further down, uh, further down the road. Yeah, so let's just go back to the presentation. Yeah, so the outline of the talk is, so I'll start off by talking about like the idea of what we're making and answer it kind of like why now and then after that i'll talk about like what like uh, for a startup should, should you go bootstrapping or should you go for a vc funding and things that you should kind of watch out when you do a dev2 startup um, that we can i kind of learned along the way and then like our first big mistake of what we did when we did a startup after that we'll kind of go more into the technical details about like building the product and the grand vision and then the last part will be like, what's next in terms of like what we're doing. So um, feel free to like shoot any questions in the Zoom chat or something. And I'll like go through it um, at the end or like some way through the presentation. So let's start off with um, a little bit of caveat, which is caveat, which is just like um, first time it's like a very early stage startup that is still in the process of searching for product market fit. So, which means that like, by no means, like we have achieved any like this form of like financial success yet. So it's like super early. And my experience is only about like a single data point in this whole, uh, in the whole like sea of startups that are in this Bay Area. And the focus of my talk will actually be on the kind of like the mid-level abstraction of the journey. So there's like high level, like sometimes people give high level talks about like startups and, and like the entrepreneurship journey, but like uh, sometimes it's not very actionable. Sometimes they give too low level details and things you do not apply. So that's why I kind of go like in the middle. So you, you kind of have like a sense of the bigger picture, but also kind of 
be able to relate and kind of follow through with the some of the things that you might maybe pick up from my talk. Yeah, so let me start. So I guess the starting part is the idea. So like every startup, there's always like this founding idea. And there's like basically two school of thoughts. Like it's a it's a spectrum. So on the very left, there's like the idea is everything, where like very Peter Thiel like of a real startup there, where you 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 have a grand vision and you you know what this is gonna be and what you're doing is just trying to like build a business that just wants to execute out this this um kind of starter. And on the very right, there is like the market will pull out the idea out of you. So this is very um I guess lean launch pad-ish sort of startup idea uh, approach where like you kind of want to let the market kind of tell you the, the uh, customers to tell you uh, what you're making and and eventually you kind of refine your product to suit what the market tells you and it might start out it might end up in a very totally different spot from where you started um so actually this uh my the, the icons are flipped so all this startups here should actually be on the right side so there's this whole school two school of thoughts and and you'll find plenty of examples that will work your way so um the market that pulled ideas out of you is actually like lift and retool and slack so for those that don't know lift is like a basically a competitor to uber one of the biggest competitor uber in the us and lift is actually uh, the origin of very ideas is in the space of ride sharing, but it's a very different starting point. It was about like sharing buses to like for people to go back to their dorms and during like winter breaks and like school breaks. So it was like the yeah, the lift car thing, right? Ride sharing was like a very side project that they actually tried out and then things actually worked, and eventually that became their main business because uh, after trying many different things. And seeing what the market wants, they actually finally converge to like making this ride sharing app. As for Slack and Ritu, Slack is uh, the famous case of like making like to making like a 180 degree pivot of what they made. So Slack kind of starts off as like a game developer. Uh, they were making a game, like some some open-ended game, but then turns out they were not getting a lot of like usage out of it. But so they had to like fire a lot of their employees and then, um, but then they realized that, hey, like since we took the uh, money of the investors, let's just try to, we made this like internal chatting tool that really was really helpful. So perhaps that would be like kind of an entry point of something bigger and then they pivoted into this and, and eventually grew to this like billion dollar company. And similar for Ritu, which is a, a much smaller startup actually, where they kind of, started off making this um they were in this financial fintech space where they tried to build like a fintech product but the thing that they were making was not super helpful but they realized that in the process hey actually um, building internal tools is actually quite troublesome it takes a lot of work so they decided that hey let's just try making this fintech tool like something to let people make internal tools to track their metrics, whatever that matters to them really easily. And that's kind of what that's like the the kind of startups that like believe that market will pull the idea out of you. It's not like the vision that you had. But on the very other end, there are like this company is Figma Notion Airtable. So Figma kind of started off as like a they were trying to make a designer too. I mean for them Figma is a little bit of a in between because they weren't exactly sure what they were doing, but they knew that they wanted to use web to make designer tools more collaborative, more friendly, and more, um, more web native. But they spent like two years kind of building the cave and trying out. And then the very similar things happened for Notion and Airtable where like in Notion, they actually started with a low code tool, realized there's nothing going on, but then they went to the cave and built this like note-taking app that they really wanted themselves. And they kind of have knew what the product was. It wasn't like they, they kind of like iterated based on the user. I mean, they, I'm sure they iterated based on user feedback, but they, they had a very certain idea of what, where they were going. And the same was for, for our table there, where they kind of raised 
uh, a round of money and like just kind of build in private, sort of in private where they tested out with like some early uses, but they weren't like putting things out there and like, okay, let's see what the market tells me what to make. So there's like this, this two main school of thought. So the way that I kind of, and like, I guess one thing is like, even when I told you this founding story, this is like based on what I've heard and like what I've learned so far. Uh, I think we should kind of be our founding stories like this because like oftentimes founders, successful startup founders, um, they tend to workshop their narrative about like the story they tell to, to make a very compelling story that, that kind of becomes memorable and uh, something that they can repeat in all the talks they give. So um, so I guess that's the caveat about all these founding stories. Like it might, when what they tell you might be one thing and what they actually did might be another. So, but regarding doing this, my take is that like, I'm leaning more towards kind of getting inspiration and where we have some sort of idea, but this idea ought to be like motivated, not from like me, um, forcing myself to think of something, but instead uh, just like based on observation uh, in my daily life and or observation that um, some interesting insight someone told me and then kind of building towards the vision, but at the same time, constantly kind of check for external validation. So, so to make sure like I'm not just like having some echo chamber kind of just uh, iterating in the cave and not knowing what's going on, but instead have this vision, but like constantly put parts of it out there to kind of test it, to see whether it actually, um, but it's the hypothesis that I have. So then the part about, so then we'll get to like, how do I, like, how did my team kind of come up with this idea? So it's kind of part observation, part inspiration. So, and, and the reason why this startup is called Time is because um, it's based off this company in the 60s that was called Timeshare, which kind of, they kind of pioneered the concept of cloud computing because, or shared computing, because like in the past computers were very expensive and then to kind of uh, use computers, you get like slices um, of usage of the computers where they do kind of uh, run a sequence of code, jump it out, run someone else's code. But then the way you connect it to it is like you, you kind of, so everyone kind of have their own monitor that connects to this computer and they just time share the, the, the compute. So the reason why I come to this idea was because like it was part version, part inspiration. So it was like this meme where like I add file to the repository, someone adds some things, I commit, my friend commits, I push. Then I always like, I realized that when I code, I will often like really try to commit my code and try to push as fast as possible before my friend does it because like I really hate to do much conflicts. And um, and I, I noticed that that was a very strange pattern when I was using Git. Um, and, and then when I took a step back, I, I noticed like some of my friends complaining about Git. Like I know Git is very powerful as a tool, but Git is also kind of hard to use. Oh, it's, it's not a very intuitive product in the sense that like, even after using many times, you might still kind of have to memorize the commands and it just requires a lot of thinking, a lot of brain power. And so, and the triggering point for me was like when my friends started facing so much issues with their get much conflict, which I knew like, yes, after you're going through it, maybe it will get better. And, um, but the fact that like, it got to the stage where like people faces lots of frustration, but they kind of take it out on themselves in terms of, like, oh, actually maybe the reason why I'm not dealing with this much conflict very well is because I don't know how to use Git, but, Git is like supposed to be a versioning controlling tool that helps you to do the job, but um, instead it seems like it's actually causing people quite a lot of trouble in terms of learning how to use it. So, and then I also took a step back to, and noticed a few trends, which is like, why now? So one thing I noticed was like, um, is storage is becoming increasingly cheaper. So, some of the constraints when Git was made was different from the constraints that we have right now. So when it's made in like the early 2000s, um, internet was not very stable and 
like compute storage, people were still storing the things in hard disk and SSD is, uh, SSD is expensive. But now things are getting storage is like a lot cheaper than what it used to be. But instead developer productivity is, product, developer productivity is kind of like the, the, the main like constraint that we're facing. And the second is like work then is becoming more remote and hybrid because of COVID. And last thing was that coding was becoming uh, more and more common as like a, as a, both as a profession and just people's interest in it. And as for like why now, that's also an important part about why now for me personally, because like when I was coming out fresh out of college, I knew that was like, it's, it's commonly, people come, uh, tell you in, in, in the startup world that like when you come out fresh out of uh, university, like that's the max, maximum probability of you meeting a potential co-founder because like <clears throat> when you go down the road, a lot of your friends, they will all become, they will all like join a, a company, um, get really comfortable. And, and then that's when they have like a very large and noticeable kind of opportunity cost in some sense, because now that they have like this huge job that's like paying them six figures now six seven figures and they have to like huh, should i deliberate and join this like scrappy startup which is likely going to fail um or can i just stay in this like cushy job um things become a lot harder for them to make this decision i guess and then the next thing was there's little liability on my side because i'm just fresh out of college like i'm not i don't have any like mortgage you know car loans like uh, no children, so it, it makes the liability issue a lot easier. And that is that like, I tend to constantly think about startup ideas. Uh, just, I think that's like one of the interests that I have. And I feel like if I just um, work for some other tech company, I'll just be spending like all my free time kind of just thinking about startup ideas. So if th this is so interesting to me, so I might as well just kind of try to pursue and kind of try it for once and see how things are like. And lastly, like this space of like code collaboration is a problem space that I have lots of familiarity with in terms of usability, just because like I am one of the potential users itself. So I kind of know what to expect in terms of like what is a good product and what is not, not a good product or if something is like totally out as compared to like me working in the space, studying something in the space where I have like zero clue of how people think there. Yeah. So one second. So the next part that I will cover is like, should you do as a startup, should you go bootstrap versus like getting external investor funding? So the thing to note here is like things are probably different in Singapore versus the US. Give me one second. So, so one thing you will need to know is that like um, the way we see funds work is that they will need to go big or go home. And that's not just like something to say to kind of stroke their ego um, because the way we see funds work is that the, venture, the, the investor that's leading the fund often have to try to use that money to invest in maybe tens of hundreds of startups. And the way it works is that usually because their time is limited in some sense, they will they can only meet so many companies. And as a result, they will tend to uh, try to invest in companies that have like a very low probability of success. I guess not the fact that it's low probability of success, but they want to invest in companies that can have like a a huge difference in their in their um, returns, and and because their funding is often the way they kind of get their funding is like they they go to um, institutions uh, or pension funds, uh, institutions for example like GIC or Temasek or you know like school university um, Stanford pension fund not pension fund Stanford's uh, what do you call that. Um, basically the endowment, and then they'll take that money, which is like, 
they'll ask them to give them money and then once they got the money they'll tell them okay i'll tell you i'll give you um you'll get your returns in 10 years and to get a return so for them to get the return in 10 years there's like a lot of lack of liquidity and as a result they will need for the fund to return well to get like a 3x return in that fund over 10 years they'll need to take some of the money and like 100x a little some of the money that they got and once the moon they 100x the money a little bit of the money they got and that's when they can be able to cover and hit the returns they need to hit and that's why a lot of vc funds are actually bet on companies that have that can become 10 billion dollar company um even though they have just like a small percentage chance of success but they are not bet on like a company that has like a 50% chance of becoming a 10 million dollar company or 100 million dollar company because even though that is a very good outcome um it's a very good outcome for the founders actually if you if you start a company that becomes um worth 10 million dollars 100 million it's a humongous difference in terms of your financial um situation it's just not very compatible with like the nature of venture funding so that's something you have to think about when you're thinking about like, whether you're doing a bootstrap or vc funding you can bootstrap something that can that you think eventually might become a billion dollar company but it's just it will be hard for you to raise vc funding if there is an obvious upper bound to the the size of the company that you can create so an example of like a company that's like a dev tool company actually that um that is not like a unicorn. Um, it's some subline text. So I heard this from um, from my friends that like subline text actually um, they they actually get like a revenue of about like one million dollars or so. And so the like the founder like the one million revenue probably they can't grow a lot much bigger than what they have right now. But um, as a founder of this company where you literally have like zero cost of production that's actually um, making a lot of money for themselves and yeah so it's a very good outcome so you just need to think about like as your company which direction do you go so on our side for time when we were looking at thinking about this we knew that like we wanted to try something that like we want to try shoot for the moon you know if things fail then sure we'll we just go back and work for like some be a software engineer at some other company but you know if we want to try something let's just try it big and also realize that the thing that we're building actually has a potential of becoming a huge market and that's why we think maybe vc funding will help us get there faster and and, and kind of scale quicker so that's where why we went for vc funding so things you want to watch out when you're doing a dev to startup, those are like, these are the three like big bullet points that like um, investors or I guess folks in this space will think about or ask you. And as an entrepreneur, if you're starting something in dev to, this is definitely something you, you need to think about. Um, so the first is the build versus buy mentality. This actually exists beyond dev to, but it's um, a little bit stronger in the space of dev too, in a sense, like this question will come out a little bit more often. And the second is like, the question is like, why wouldn't you make it open source? This is a question your customers might ask you if you're trying to sell them something, like let's say you wrote some code that they can, like you wrote some really cool library that do something really great. Then they'll ask you, hey, are you just trying to like sell this because you wanted to make money? Yeah, or um, are you making this a business because, you know, um like why not just make it like free for i want to use you know, it costs you nothing to share it right it costs you nothing to kind of replicate it so why why do you want to charge money for it um that's kind of the mentality that a lot of developers have um and and usually it's a valid concern in terms of that like sometimes like if it's not hard to make the thing that you are trying to sell them someone else would might try to create an open source version of the thing you're making and and kind of undermine your business 
And last question, the last question that people often have is like, is this a, how big is the market? And because like, I mean, how, there's how many developers are there in the world? And like, if you're only targeting, like, let's say you're only targeting developers that code for iOS, uh, that only use a certain payment types, maybe that's like a too small of a market. So that's something that you might watch out. Like what's the upper bound of the market that, that you are kind of targeting? So for us, we, the three things, this three kind of like things to watch out, um, they're like ways to kind of avoid, not avoid it, but like if, you, if the idea they have view is kind of um, against it or like have strengths that would like kind of counter these things, then that will make it work. So for example, for the build versus by mentality, because we are kind of building this code collaboration tool for people to code on some sort of like an editor. Um, it's just simply to out of the way for people to build it. Because like as a developer, oftentimes you don't really go build your editor that you use. As opposed to like, let's say I'm selling you a web server, then you're asking me, then you might ask me, hey, why can't I just like make my own web server? Why should I buy the web server that you made? Um, so, so for the first question, we really are not like, people don't really usually have the build versus buy mentality when they kind of consider our product. So regarding why not make it open source, oftentimes um, open, open, open source products, they, if they are just like a library, uh, but if it's very complex, they might, they can spin out to a, become a company. So for example, like, uh, Databricks is a company where they created this kind of open source tool called Spark that let people uh, process huge amount of data in, in, in a distributed way. So this the underlying like technology of Spark is open source, but then they created this kind of um, a supporting company that kind of helps create a hosted, they, can, they have a hosted version of Spark where they can run things from there. And they also kind of do consulting uh, for kind of developers using Spark. So that's kind of where they made their money. And the other alternative is if your product is open source, but, oh yeah, you, you're building a dev tool, but there's a huge hosted element to it. Like for example, Ngrok, where Ngrok just lets you kind of um, tunnel the, the, the things that you're building out into a web. And so everyone can kind of see it from the open web. When you have a hosted element to it, developers, open source developers tend not to like it because like, Sure, the open source developers are like the enjoyment of like making, writing the code or like having like someone building something new and something cool, but they don't really like to have to go through the pain of like having to wake up at like 10, 12 a.m. in the morning to kind of bug fix something and, and kind of get the server back rolling again. It's just too much of a commitment for something to do for free. So oftentimes when you have a hosted element to it, it will actually make it your dev to start up easier to, to sell. I guess the last part is that for a potentially small market for what you're building, since all developers are part of the potential market here, hence the, the market that we can possibly target might actually be not that small. So, um, so in some sense, we kind of have proposed reasons of like why we might still succeed in this space. Yeah, so before I go into the book rec, um, so yeah, so given like this dev tool startup for what we're building, um, we kind of like managed to address all of them, but there's this one big question that we get from uh, a lot of developers is like, developers tend to have like a huge attachment to the editor that they're using. And that makes a lot of sense because like, as a developer, you kind of have uh, your, your editor is kind of your your environment that you spend all your time working in. It's like your office in some sense um, where you have to, so oftentimes you kind of spend a lot of effort, a lot of, a lot of time into like the setup, into developing your habits, developing your workflow, kind of all this like muscle memory you have to it. And then to ask you to switch out of it, of course you really, it's, you develop a huge attachment to, to, to what you have set up already because um, that is what makes you productive and you wouldn't want to kind of switch it up. But one thing that we noticed that kind of supports this trend was that 
I want to support the trend, but like one thing that we noticed that that might actually have to help was that VS Code was getting a lot more adoption in recent years. It started maybe three or four years ago, VS Code had like 10% adoption, but over time they became 30%, 40%, 50%, and I think 70% of the developers now, and all this in the Stack Overflow survey said that they have tried and used VS Code before in, 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 in development, which is a sign that like, maybe there's some sort of convergence into um, the capabilities of um, editors. And VS Code is an open source editor. And hence, if we can make something that kind of matches the behavior of VS Code, um, then we might be able to kind of get developers to at least not have such a huge switching cost. So um, yeah, so then that's kind of how we kind of overcome the challenge. And, and then this is a fun, funny story that kind of comes from this book. So this book is called The Art of Doing Science and Engineering by Richard Hamming, which is like a, I think it's a physicist, if I recall correctly, that also did a little bit of computer science and he, he did some pioneering work and error correction code. So um, the reason why I recommend this book is because I mean, it's generally, generally a very good book to kind of read. And there's like this like, little anecdote from the book where like when Richard Hamming was kind of doing using computers. So he was there when like computers first became digital. Before that computers were referred to women that actually did calculations for like what um for for the, the scientists or whoever that's like hiring them. So they're they're called computers, even though they are people. But then slowly they they started to build computers. And when computers were started, like people had to code in binary or like in pen and paper and like and punch holes. But then like um they had to code in binaries and they had to debug in binary, which is like a pain in the ass if you have actually did anything that is even close to exemplary level of code coding. But then um then after a while, they introduced something called uh, symbolic programming and eventually Fortran, which is like one of the first few languages that were kind of symbolic programming in a sense that you don't have to kind of look at the ones and zero anymore of like the execution instruction and also the, the kind of the, the memory is that you can just like write use symbols like let A equals X, let A equals two. Um, so when they first introduced that symbols, symbolic programming to the existing programmers, they all hated it. They thought coding with like symbols is for sissy. So that's literally what they say. And they would actually just prefer debugging in binary. But to us right now, like in retrospect, this seems very obvious that no one's gonna want to code in binary. Like we all want to operate in a higher abstraction level. But to those people that are stuck in their existing workflow, they were kind of resisting changes in that in their workflow, even though ultimately is going to make them like 10 times more productive. So that's the same kind of learning there. I kind of also apply in terms of like when we pitch the product or when we kind of try to convince, uh, when we think about this, this uh, product that we're building, which is like a, a, a multiplayer editor, because like people would, Inherent be, inherently be resistant to any changes, even though there can possibly be like a huge productive gain from kind of having, allowing them to kind of code together collaboratively. So yeah, so this is just like an interesting story from this book. Uh, generally, generally this book is quite pretty good in like guiding you in terms of how to think. So maybe something that you might want, want to just check out. So our first bit mistake was that we, got into fundraising slash acquisition talks when we were not yet ready. Um, and that's because um, we, we, we kind of got led into this talk. So for example, we, uh, for the fundraising talk, that was like when my partner and I were still kind of debating, hey, should, what should we do next? Should we, should we just kind of work on this idea part-time? Should we kind of go full-time and, and raise the money? Uh, we were having these debates, but we, we 
when we kind of communicate it to some of our mentors that we were working with, they kind of um, maybe misunderstood or maybe intentionally misunderstood, we are not so sure, but they kind of connect to us, the folks to start talking about it. We thought initially, hey, it's just like a friendly discussion, you know, get to know each other. Um, maybe when we are ready to fundraise, we actually go into uh, to talk. But then like when we went jumped in the meeting, they started talking to us about like the valuations um, and that's when we had a huge shock. So like this guy that we were talking to, he was like the co-founder of Tinder, which was like uh, to, to someone like me that has like already met like famous people. Um, it seemed like, oh, well, this guy's a big shot and he's like offering me this, this valuation. It seems really cool. Maybe I should really think about it. But the fact that like when you get into this kind of fundraising mode or things that you're not ready to do, you actually spend a lot of time, uh, time sync because like when you're not ready, you kind of have some suboptimal orange arrangement. Like maybe you haven't arranged all your other investors meeting to kind of make them compete each other to, to give you the best offer that you can get. And also it kind of wasted time from both parties because like in the end we had the time, hey, actually give us like three more weeks. We need really to think about this uh, more properly. But then he was like pushing really hard. It's like, hey, hey, let's let's move fast. I like guys that move fast. And you guys should kind of get back to, to answer um, to me. So that was the case for us. But luckily, we we were able to get uh, we were able to move forward from there. But we wasted quite a little bit of time from the mis uh, suboptimal planning. So don't don't go into fundraising mode or like acquisition talks when you are not planning to do that. So the last part I'll kind of cover really quickly is like what we did in terms of like building the product. So another book that I really recommend is this book called Inspired by Marty Kagan on how to create tech products that customers love. So one of the big lessons from this book is that you should always try to use prototypes and experiments to kind of move fast. So in a startup, you have very limited resources and time. So you have limited money, you have limited time, you have limited manpower. So if you, so unlike a big company where like you can ex make mistakes and like survive and like, you know, just roll through the revenue that your big company is earning, you actually have very little, you have little, very little margin room for error. So once you kind of, if you go back and you spend too much time doing things that didn't work, you, you actually kind of decrease the chance of your company surviving. So instead of like you having to build a huge humongous product, maybe it was it's easier to kind of, it's actually less risky to kind of like come up with tests or proxies of experiments that you can do that would take orders of magnitude less resources. So like maybe something that, so for example, something that we had to do was like we had to kind of build a VS Code editor or like a VS Code light editor in a short period of three months. But, um, we, there was like some uncertainties there. Like we didn't know, oh, is it possible to do it? Uh, even if it's possible to do it, like would people use it? Uh, if they use it, what sort of use case? Um, are they gonna? Is, are they gonna care about? Uh, what should we focus on? And all these questions seems like things that um, maybe only after you build it can you figure out the answers. But um, there are always like tricks that you can do or ways you can kind of um, estimate. Uh, by doing little experiments. So for example, we kind of like um, figure out some of the open source uh, projects that did something similar to us and like see whether we can kind of pull their code and like re replicate what they're doing and kind of understand, understand where they're going and just write a very quick, dirty prototype of doing the same thing as that did just to test whether the concept is possible. And once we know that the concept is possible, then we actually spend the, the uh, dedicated effort of trying to like make things work in a proper engineering way. So, um, yeah, so we tested a lot of things, uh, prototype, and from there we, so when you're building a product in the startup, there are like one of the main considerations, considerations like, do you want to build a maintainable code base or would you want to build something that there's really quick and then throw away? And like as a CS student or someone that's taught to engineering, uh, trained in engineering school, it feels like the second part is like something that 
you should not do the first part is like the build maintainable code is something that you kind of be, have been trained in some of the code review you and even when you join internships when you when you join big companies that's what they kind of tell you you know you want to make write good code and then something that's maintainable but when you're doing startups when you're doing like prototypes and when you're kind of building things really quickly just to test certain concepts you sometimes you might just want to build some things really quickly and then once you kind of validate your hypothesis then you kind of just like build in and, and move on because maybe that thing that you made wasn't useful or maybe the thing you made super useful and actually people are using it and then even when they're using your very janky very shaky product that's when you know that okay maybe this is, is you hit something there no we should try to make something that's a lot more maintainable so one of the considerations that we did had was like should we fork vs code or should kind of should we just made a DIY, DIY Monaco? Monaco is a editor that VS Code is based after, and kind of string the other custom parts out of it. And um, the other consideration that consideration that we had for making things multiplayer was that we need to think whether we want to use CRDT, which stands for conflict conflict replicated data types, or was operation transform, um, which is another way of like kind of um, res resolving the different inputs that user have in the text into one like consistent output. So like these are all different considerations we had to kind of play, think about like and balance, and eventually um, make a decision of like based on the constraints that we as a startup is facing, we have to kind of make the decision of what to make next. Yeah. So beyond the building product, so this is kind of like the grand vision. This is like a very I just made this in like five minutes, which is a of like grand vision of what we are making, which is what time have now. So in some sense, right now in coding, there's like the asynchronous coding where you kind of use get or uh, uh, to kind of collaborate your friend or synchronous coding collaboration where you kind of just either sit next to your friend, sit next to your teammate and then just code together or you kind of screen sharing what you have. Um, what we want to do is like there's this like, kind of this dichotomy uh, we want to just kind of merge both into one thing where people collaborate just by sending something over regardless whether it's synchronous or asynchronous um, so it's very, very similar to Google Docs you don't kind of think whether I should commit into Google Docs or whether I should work with them in person right now because you, you kind of just send the link for the over to them and then eventually um if the if both of you are online at the same time, great. You can kind of just work on it together. But if the both of you are like one one of them is offline, you can just work asynchronously. You don't have to like make the decision of is this going to be like a synchronous or asynchronous collaboration. And the other, the other part is like the coding env and the review env environment that we people have. Like right now, people often code on the editor, but they review on GitHub, which is fine actually. But like, which is fine for most use cases. But like, there are certain situations where it's actually much easier to kind of read through the code or maybe you want to test the code you're building. And hence this separation of the coding environment, the review environment actually makes some things a little bit harder. And the last thing that we also want to kind of merge was like now people would like to track their source code with GitHub, uh, source code with Git, but they don't track, but everything else like the, the uh, environment variables, the dependencies that they are they're using, um, I guess the dependency environment, all like secret codes, uh, secret codes, like secret API keys and stuff, they all like track in a different way because like you're not supposed to add things to Git because it's dangerous. Um, we think that kind of thinking is no longer relevant, not no longer relevant. like that can be a better tool to kind of manage all this instead of having us to send to each other, send the uh, stuff over Slack message to each other. So kind of. So in some sense, the grand vision of our product is to kind of fuse everything into this, from this dichotomy into this like single point in the center. And hopefully that will become like a big enough delta, big enough change in, in the coding experience that most developers would switch into what we're making. So what's next for us is that we just launched uh, our beta product. So you can check out our thing on time, dot so to try out the beta 
since uh, a lot of you, I believe, might be computer science students. And now that we have kind of made a initial prototype, I don't prototype, I guess like a very minimal product that we have of just a synchronous product, we are going to like the fundraising mode. And we are also hiring um, both in the US as like for interns or full times. Uh, or, and we might eventually also in, expand to Singapore. So you might want to check out our website on time.so. Uh, there's like a link on the, um, in, in the landing page that talks about hiring. Yeah, so that's all of my talk. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to um, just tap in the chat or like just ask me. But otherwise, thanks for the time. So Joel asked, what code should we use to sign up for the beta? So um, the, the best way is that you go to time.s, oh, actually, YouTube is the, um, go to this link that I sent in the group chat. And then uh, once you kind of click the access link, we will actually manually send you the email very soon after to kind of just um, give you the access code of how to get started with some instructions on how to get started. So that's the best way. So if there are more questions, thank you, Inhang, for your insightful talk. And we'll be having a two-minute break while we're waiting for the second speaker to set up. So I'd like to thank everyone for the time for having me here. But I think since it's uh, 3 a.m. here in the in the Pacific time, I think I'll go to sleep right now. And I hope you guys had a great Friday evening. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. The second speaker will be Sheng Yu, who will be talking about KTOR. Sheng Yu is a developer advocate at JetBeans, and he is fascinated with researching new technology and is fond of skills that increase productivity. And in charge of promoting technology such as Kotlin, IntelliJ Idea, and um, provide solutions, he passionately contributed to open source communities and contributed to those for over seven years. So let's welcome him. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Shen Yeo. Uh, it's nice to uh, <clears throat> have me tonight. And uh, I, <clears throat> I'm a developer advocate at JetBrains. So um, basically, uh, my responsibility is to um, introduce our product and our technology uh, to our uh, to the developers. So including the the, the IntelliJ IDEA uh, IDE and also the coding programming language. So today I will want to talk about Cater. It's our uh, web framework uh, building uh, using uh, Kotlin. So I will uh, introduce introduce what is Cater and how to build a web API um, in, in, in about 30 minutes. Okay, let's get started. So um, before we jump into the, the uh, cater, but I want to spend some time to introduce what is Kotlin. Uh, I think most of the developers know Kotlin because uh, the Google Android team choose Kotlin as their primary language. So therefore you must be familiar with the bottom right corner that you can use Kotlin uh, to write Android application. But actually in the beginning, Kotlin was targeting JVM. So it's, you, you can imagine that it's kind of a Java replacement that bring many syntax sugar, uh, modern language tool chain and more. So Kotlin could be used on the server side. Uh, you can see the bottom left corner. So also I want to mention that uh, if you have ever tried uh, IntelliJ IDEA or any uh, JetBrains IDE, the IntelliJ IDEA platform is um, right, written in Kotlin. So uh, we want to have a more modern language and, uh, um, and we, with some syntax sugar and um, reduce the error. So uh, basically you can use Kotlin uh, to write desktop application as well. So not only server side, uh, but, also, uh, but also desktop application. And uh, you can see the top right corner, uh, not only Android and server side, um, thanks for the Kotlin native project. You can use Kotlin to write the iOS app. So in the last, last year, uh, the Kotlin team uh, released a Kotlin multi-platform mobile uh, to help you to write multiple uh, multi-platform mobile app. So um, it, 
it's kind of a framework and uh, uh, and a plugin for Android Studio. So uh, the, that plugin could help you to create a, a Kotlin multi-platform mobile project in Android Studio, and you can write a Kotlin code um, for Android and iOS app. And uh, we can use Gradle to publish the, the application into the, the Android, uh, Android platform and iOS app store. And also uh, it must uh, sounds crazy. Uh, you can also use Kotlin to write front end code. So we had Kotlin JS, uh, that means Kotlin compile um, could convert your Kotlin code into native JavaScript. So basically you can see that in this diagram, Kotlin could be a multi-platform language to help you do uh, almost everything for the every platform. Um, but um, I know that we can do a lot with Kotlin, but today I will focus on the server side uh, because I'm a backend developer. So I will introduce you a web framework from JetBrains called Cater. Uh, we know we can build a web application on JVM, but um, building from scratch um, is, is tedious. So you need to manually handle HTTP requests and response and the status code, etc. So in JetBrains, we need the lightweight framework that could easily build microservice on, uh, for our new product space. So we built Cater. Um, it's the web framework that has both server-side component and client-side component. So for the server-side, you can use Cater to develop a web API or web page. And for the front-end side, you can use uh, Cater HTTP client to request HTTP uh, request and get a response from, the, uh, from another server. <clears throat> so um, it leveraged, uh, Cater also leveraged the, the asynchronized feature. So uh, in Kotlin, we have a framework called coroutine. So if your framework could support coroutine, that means you can have handle the asynchronized request and response. That means you can bring more uh, performance to your application. And we uh, open source this framework under Apache 2.0. So if you have more interesting on that, you can go uh, cater.io to, to know more detail. And we have uh, complicated um, documentation on our website. So today I will use Cater to build an API service. So in this slide, um, the HTTP request is coming from our client, no matter uh, it's, it's from a web browser or a mobile phone. The HTTP request will go into our Cater application. Then we will connect to our database and return the result uh, using JSON format. Uh, in this case, we will use MySQL uh, for our example. So um, let's start um, by creating a new uh, Kato application. So back to my IntelliJ idea. So you can see my desktop. Uh, this is IntelliJ idea ultimate version. And uh, um, <clears throat> in this welcome screen, uh, let's click the create project. And in IntelliJ idea, uh, there's a lot of different project template that you can choose. Uh, one of the project template is Cater. So in the newer version, uh, IntelliJ IDEA already bundled the Cater plugin into the, the, the IDE, so you can use it right away after you installed. So let's uh, choose Cater and you can give the project name, for example, Cater in action. And then we can store this project under our IntelliJ IDEA project. And you can choose either um, Gradle Kotlin DSL or Gradle Groovy or Maven um, because I want it 100% Kotlin. So I will use uh, Kotlin DSL for Gradle. Then you can um, design your um, package name. So for example, my I will say my package name is craft craftsman.io, uh, this is my website, and we will use this for my page name. 
and then you can choose the cater version. So basically I will use the most stable version 1.6.7 and any other uh, option I will use the default, <laughs> default choice. So the next step is to, uh, you can uh, decide uh, which plugin you want to use in your Kata application. So let's back to our slides and I want to um, introduce what is plugin. So in Kata that uh, you can see it's a very lightweight uh, framework. If you have another uh, programming language experience that you might heard about uh, Express.js in JavaScript or Sinatra in, in Ruby or Flask, uh, in, in Python. So it's basically uh, the same concept in Kotlin. And it can it had a routing mechanism and was assigned to a handler to process the request and return the response. And between the, the handler, we could install as many as plugin you want and to bring more feature into this application. So you can imagine that a plugin is sort of a ability. So that is the ability for the, the application. So for example, if we want Cater to handle JSON uh, because we want to build a web API and we use JSON format for the request and response. So we will need to install a serialization plugin in our Cater application. So back to our IntelliJ idea, um, let's search uh, JSON in the plugin. <clears throat> so uh, I will install the cutting X dot serialization is a cutting multi-platform library uh, using a, a design for the calling team. So I will add this plugin into my uh, Kata application. Also, um, cutting X serialization has dependency with content negotiation and routing plugin. So Kata Cater plugin will um, notify you that you need to install uh, third, uh, these third plugins to have the ability to handle JSON. Okay, so you can see that uh, we have installed three plugins for our, plug, uh, for our application. Then we will uh, click finish. IntelliJ IDEA will help you to um, create a new plugin uh, using the Cater a project template. So it will spend a little time to uh, process the Gradle build. Uh, the Gradle will help you to um, install all the dependency from the internet. And also it will create a project structure uh, in IntelliJ IDEA. So during its, uh, during its running, let's back to our... Um, <coughs> slide and we can uh, think about uh, how we can design an API. So in this sample, I would like to have two kinds of API. One is just a hello world API. So we will uh, design a URL uh, is, is from document root and slash hello, and it will accept application JSON uh, format. If you open your uh, browser and hit this URL, then a uh, cater will re reply a uh, JSON format and it contain a message, message field and also hello cater in the message. So that's our first API. And the second task we want to do is we want to create a product API. So we will design our API just like um, we will uh, use the root root URL, and then we will append API slash V1 slash products to, uh, to have the versioning and also the product naming on our URL. And this, this, uh, this HTTP route also accept application JSON. So that's the, the API design we want to do. So um, let's back to our IntelliJ idea. And you can see that uh, we already uh, finished the initialized build. So we can open up the file under uh, Kotlin and application.kt. 
So every uh, Kotlin application, we will need the main function. Uh, it's kind of an uh, entry point for application. So if we want to run this application, we just need to click the green play button in IntelliJ Idea Editor Gutter. And then uh, in this main function, we will have an embedded server. Uh, it's a top level function that will help you to initialize a K2 application. And inside this Lambda, we have two functions. One is configure routing and one is configure serialization. Um, as we mentioned before, that cater is structured by several plugins. So if you want to add some ability to your cater application, for example, we want to add uh, Hello World API and product API, then we need to uh, add more and more plugin inside your uh, cater application. So let's take the serialization plugin, for example, so in this uh, serialization.kt file, you can see that in the beginning, we install the content negotiation plugin into this route. And then we say we want to use JSON handler to, to serialize and deserialize our string into the JSON format. And Kater, uh, it provides a very um, beautiful DSL syntax to help you to define your application route. So uh, as you, <clears throat> you can see that you just open up a routing uh, Lambda. And in this Lambda, you can say that I want to have a, a route that is the URL is JSON slash Kotlin X dash serialization. And it will accept the HTTP get method. And if anyone hit this application route, then the application will return a, a map. Uh, the map, the key is hello and the value is word. So after Kater uh, passing this map into a serialization plugin, the serialization plugin will uh, serialize this map into a JSON string. So that's the, the metric behind the, the, the application. So if we want to uh, implement the first API, the Hello World API um, in this application, the, the thing we need to do is to change the URL to hello. And then we need to change this map. We said that we want to have uh, um, the key is message in the map and the value is hello cater. Okay, it's super simple, right? So uh, if we want to run this application to test our result, then we uh, will switch to uh, application.kt and hit this green button. And IntelliJ IDEA will help you to compile this source code and run your application. Okay, so you can see that our application is running in, um, in our local host, uh, A0, A0. So um, let's open up a HTTP request scratch file in IntelliJ IDEA. So head to our project panel and you can use the shortcut command N and we can create a scratch file and the file type is HTTP request. In this HTTP file request, you can uh, imagine that this is kind of um, Postman in IntelliJ IDEA. So you can, you can say that we want to have a HTTP GET request and we will hit the uh, localhost A0, A0 and slash hello. And we will accept the application JSON format for this uh, HTTP response. So then we can use the shortcut option enter to uh, actually run this, uh, run this request. So IntelliJ IDEA will uh, request um, to our application and our application will return the JSON format for us. So you can see that uh, our uh, JSON result is uh, a hello world message. The key is message 
and the value is allocated. That is exactly we design in the application route. Okay, so we uh, finished the first task to build up a Hello World uh, uh, API. So the second API that we want to build is a product API. So um, we can continue writing in this routing DSL. So we can open up a get function and in the path parameter, we can say that we want to have a URL slash API slash V1 slash products. In every um, application route, Cater will pass the call object. The call object is an application code. And if you see our application, uh, our slide, an application code is um, the diagram that we display here. It includes a HTTP request, our routing, and our handler and the response. So basically, um, Cater will give you the application code object, then you can set up, uh, you can receive the data from the request and you can also set up the response for the application. So back to our code. So we can say that we want to have a um, response and we, we also give it a map. And in this map, we want to, um, for example, our, our key is data and we want to give, give Cater a product. The product is, uh, is a list or array to store all of the product information in, in this variable. So we want to uh, return this product to the user. So, but we don't have any products, right? So um, we have to, design our product, the, the, our, product uh, our product structure uh, using data class. So um, in this API, we want to, for example, return 10 items of product. So I want to generate a list from one to 10. Then I want to map um, this, this uh, integer into a product DTO. So product DTO is kind of a data transfer object and we will implement this DTO uh, using a uh, Kotlin data class. So as you can imagine that uh, which kind of data will include in, in a product. For example, we want to have an ID and the ID might be a integer. So we can get it from the, the list. So we can use it to represent the integer in this, uh, this, this list from one to 10. And second, we want to have a title. The title might be, for example, product. And we can give in a number. Then we will have a description for the, the product. And also we will have a pro have price for product. So uh, for example, our product price is well, 100.0. And our, maybe we, our product system have a rate ranking. So we will have a, a rating column for the product. So the rating is from one to, to five. So maybe uh, four. And also we will have a thumbnail. It's a product image. So the product image might be a URL for the, the image file. So we can say, for example, uh, www.image.com slash product. And we can have ID in the product name. Okay. Then we will uh, store this list into map. So we will uh, use postfix to generate the, the variable 
from the, the list. So now we have products. But you can see that here is the red code in IntelliJ IDEA because we uh, not actually define what is product DTO. So you can place your uh, mouse cursor and hit option enter to create a class called project DTO. And I will spend, uh, I will store this file under the, for example, DTO folder. Okay, so you, you can see that IntelliJ IDEA is smart enough to generate the code for you. And be, because we already assigned the, the parameter for the product DTO, so IntelliJ IDEA will revert the data type for you. So basically you just hit tab, tab to every uh, parameter. And then we don't need, need the, the query press and we can uh, put parameter on separate lines. And we say that this, this uh, class is kind of a DTO, so it's a data class. For data class, you have to define every uh, property. To value. Okay. And we will um, send this uh, data class into serialization plugin. So you have to add a, not a notation to um, determine that this data class could be serialized. So let's add a notation, serialize, serializable, and we can import it from the packaging. Okay, so now we uh, finish this part, you can see that the red code uh, was gone. So um, in this uh, product API, we will generate 10 fake uh, product DTO from the list and we will store in the variable. Then we will uh, put it into a map and serialize to the user. So uh, we can restart our application uh, by hitting the run button. Okay, you can see that uh, our application has been re restarted then we can have another HTTP request in our uh, scratch file. So this request is also using uh, HTTP get uh, method. And then we can uh, go to API v1 um, products. And we also accept application JSON. So let's see if we uh, successfully uh, finish this part. Okay, so you, as you can see that uh, our application will return 10 products using JSON format. And every product have uh, its own ID, title, description, price, uh, rating, thumbnail, and the data is a little bit different between the product. And all the products were stored in under the data field. Okay, so um, we've uh, finished the first stage and then we want to make this application more dynamic. So I will use a fake library to generate fake data in our, uh, in our product to make this API response more real. So you can open up the dependency uh, panel and every time you want to manage your dependency, you can open up your build.gradle.kts file. And we can search, for example, we want to have a Java faker library from our application. Uh, okay, so um, basically um, this dependency panel will help you to search the, the Kotlin or Java library uh, from the internet. So uh, we can see that the first result is what we want is a Java faker library. So we will click add and IntelliJ IDEA will help you to insert the dependency uh, declaration in your build.gradle.kts. So let's refresh our uh, Gradle. 
then we will have the faker plugin. So back to our serialization. Um, in this API, we will need to have a faker object uh, from our uh, new, newly installed plugin. So this is the, the library that we just installed. And then we need to initialize this object into a instant. Then we can change the, the content in our product DTO. So for example, in, in the title, we can use Faker to generate uh, the Lauren Lipson to have, a, for example, sentence. And for the description, uh, we need more sentence. So we will use Faker to uh, generate the Lauren Lipson for the paragraph. For the price, we need need some random number. So I will use the, um, the, the random library that from the Kotlin standard library to generate the, the double number from, 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 the, from the library. So for example, we, uh, we will generate the price from one to, uh, for example, 1000. Okay, for the rating, we can also use the random library to generate the integer from, for example, from zero to five. <clears throat> okay, for the thumbnail, we will need, uh, we can also use Faker to generate the internet thingy and we can generate the um, fake image from the internet. Okay, so that's what we did. And then we can restart our application. So this time you will see that the result in our JSON format will be a little different. All the data will like a real data. So let's hit our uh, HTTP request again. As you can see that this is the previous uh, response and this is our response from this time. And we can compare uh, two response using IntelliJ IDEA. So you can see that in the right hand, that is the original uh, the API response that only generated product one, two, three, four to 10 is kind of um, not, not that real. But in, in the left hand, you can see that all the title and description uh, are generated uh, using the Lauren Lipson and all the price and the rating are randomly. So that is a uh, more realistic data in our API. Okay, so uh, we, I, I think we, we uh, finished the second stage uh, of our development. So the third stage, we will need to have a, a database to store all of the data that we generate from the Faker library. So before we um, use the, 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 the database, we need, need a library that help us to connect to the database. So in JetBrains, we also have a library called Exposed. It's an ORM framework that both support the DSL style and the DAO style to write a SQL query. Uh, we also open source in Apache 2.0. And if you want to know more detail, you can go to our GitHub and we have a, a documentation to describe how to use uh, Expose using DSL syntax or DAO. But today I personally, I prefer to use DAO pattern. It, it's, it's kind of, uh, you can represent your data in a Kotlin class and object to represent your data in the database. So for the table that we, you can see that we will store a lot of different products in our database. So we can declare a, a object using Kotlin. Uh, we will name it products and 
the, the table will use int for ID column. And then we will represent our title, description, price, rating, thumbnail uh, in the column. And each column have different data type. For example, a uh, title and uh, using varchar. And we will use text for description using um, double for price and integer for the rating, for example. So product object will represent the, the table in your database. And then we need a uh, entity. Uh, it's a calling class that basically uh, look very similar with your uh, product DTO, but it represents the data in the table. So uh, we have a database that have several tables and each tables will have several uh, data row. So the products will represent the uh, products table and the product will represent a single data in the products table. So that's the relationship between the, the table and the entity. So back to our uh, IntelliJ idea. So let's create a new package called entities. And I will add a new um, class called um, product. This is for entity. And I, I just want to save some time so you can see that I um, in <clears throat> generate all the code I need for the product entity. Then we will create a new product a package called tables. And also we need to um, create a product object for, for, the, uh, for the table. Okay, so also I use the code generation to, to generate the code I need to save some time. And before we actually run this code, we need to add more dependency into our project. So open up the de dependency panel. Um, we need JetBrains exposed. Uh, this is um, the exposed library from JetBrains and we can search in the, <clears throat> in the dependency panel. And we will need a core library. Uh, let's open up the build.gradle.kts for, for the result. So you can see that we need core library and we also need a DAO because we use the ORM model for this project. Also we need JDBC for the connection. And since we will use the uh, the MySQL. So we will use, need to add con MySQL connector to connect to MySQL. So let's add dependency as well. So after we add all the dependency, don't forget to re-import your Gradle. And in the meantime, I will also add a new file uh, called docker compose.yaml. And I will generate a Docker Compose file to have a, a MySQL image to, to, um, to have a MySQL instance for my project. And also I need to um, initialize my Docker daemon uh, in the background. Okay. So let's back to our um, entity and uh, and the table. So um, there are several red code. So just because we don't have the dependency before, so just use option enter to re-import all the necessary. Library for the, uh, for the file. Also, uh, let's back to the uh, tables, use option enter. So you can see that all the red code gone because we have the dependency. Okay, so uh, you can see that my Docker uh, daemon already running. So we can switch to Docker Compose. Uh, just click the ring button, then uh, in IntelliJ IDEA will help you to uh, initialize the Docker container to have uh, MySQL. So you can see that we already have a MySQL running in the background. 
and our uh, root password is root. So let's try to connect to the um, to the database. So open up the database panel. You can add the data source using my SQL driver. And as you can see that uh, in the poll forwarding, we will forward the MySQL port to our local port. So in this port setting, don't forget to use our local port. And our username is root and password is root. Please don't do that because we, we are in the development stage. So we can use root root for the uh, username and password, but don't do that in the in the uh, production. Okay, so add, uh, we can add database and then we will uh, apply. So IntelliJ idea will try to connect to our um, MySQL server inside the Docker container. Okay, so that's the, the, the database we will need to use uh, later. Okay, so we have our uh, Docker container for MySQL. We have our um, product for the entity and the products for our table. Then we will jump back to our code to connect to our database. So in our Kato application, uh, in the beginning, just right before, uh, just right after the the plugin install, then we will need to connect to our database. So you can see that uh, we can use the expose database object to connect to our uh, local MySQL server. So I will use the uh, local host and the the simple. Um, database in our MySQL server and use the right driver and give it the username password. So after we connect to the database, then we can uh, run some query to the database. So before you write the query to the database, you have to open up a transaction um, in, in, in Kato application. Then we will use schema utility to create the table that we want. So our table definition is we uh, used uh, was definition by the, the product object. So in this uh, create method, you just post the product table to it, and it will help you to create the product table in your MySQL uh, database. Second, I want to um, create uh, to generate some fake data and insert into our MySQL database. And then we will retrieve that data in our API. So I will borrow some code from here. So we will, um, we will generate 10 uh, product in this list. But this time we will use product entity to create a new entry in our uh, database. And then we will use Faker to generate the, the necessary uh, column uh, for our uh, product data. Then we will also need this Faker object in our transaction. Okay, and in this Lambda, we don't need the semicolon. Okay. Okay, so uh, I think we done for the generation. Then we will um, temporarily comment this code for later use. And let's just restart our application to see if we successfully insert all the generate data into our database. Um, okay, so I don't... Okay, let's do that again. Okay, as you can see that um, Expose will um, generate the SQL query for you and insert the data into the database. So this time we refresh the database 
and we can see that here comes a new table called products. And if you double click the product name, then it will uh, show the, uh, the content in the database. So that's the 10 result that we generate in the database. So we successfully uh, generate and insert the data into the database. So the next step we want to do is to uh, retrieve the data from the database. So let's uh, comment up. So in our API, we also need to open up a transaction to um, retrieve the data from database. So this time we will use product uh, entity to retrieve all data from the database. And then we will uh, remap all the data and transfer it to product DTO. Uh, because uh, we we can uh, we could serialize the product DTO, but we cannot uh, serialize the product uh, entity. So just use the uh, mapping te uh, technique, then you can uh, transfer your ob object into another type of class. So um, in this product DTO, we will use, um, for example, ID we will got from the um, entity and the uh, ID column, and we will retrieve the value from the column. Then we will uh, convert the title, also the description, the price, and also the rating. Okay, so I think we done for this part. So um, after this transaction, all the product will convert into product DTO. So we, we could store into a variable. So we can use products as well. So since we use the same name of the variable, so uh, we don't need to uh, modify any code in this line. Okay, so this time after we um, <clears throat> re restart our application, we can retrieve the data from the database. Okay, so let's restart our application. Okay, so you can see that um, our application is running and we can switch to our HTTP request. So let's hit the API again. You can see that each time we uh, restart our application, Cater will generate 10 items and insert into database. So this is our second time to restart the application after we have a, a MySQL server. So now we have 20 uh, products in our database. So you can see that uh, the first one is um, something like that, so we can see the result and compare the, the title from the database and our API result. So you can see that we have 20 products in our API and also it reflects from the database. So that's basically all the development uh, from uh, using the, the expose. Uh, and MySQL database. Okay, so we are uh, almost done. So the, the final thing we need to do is to um, pack this K2 application into a container. Then we can deploy this container into our Docker registry. So um, you can see that the pack and deploy workflow is something like that. Um, we develop our source code in IntelliJ IDEA then we will use a, a tool called Jeep that is developed by Google Cloud. Uh, it will help you to um, 
generate the Docker container and um, pad your application into the container, then it will also help you to upload the Docker container to your Docker registry. And it, it support a uh, various registry uh, from the internet. So you can uh, upload your Docker image to uh, Docker Hub or GCP or Azure or AWS or something like that. And then you can deploy your image to your production server. So um, before we pack our application, we need to install the JIP. Uh, that is a Gradle plugin to help you to automate this workflow for you. So we need to uh, open up the build.gradle file and add a JIP plugin in your Gradle file. So back to our uh, build.gradle.kts file uh, in the beginning that will have the plugin definition here. So we will add JIP uh, plugin in our uh, Gradle. <clears throat> so we import your Gradle, um, it will download the JIP plugin and install it. So after we uh, install the JIP plugin, you can see that in your Gradle panel, that we have a new task group called JIP. So you can see that we have the JIP command and then we can use it to generate the, the, the Docker image. So um, before we uh, deploy, um, let's jump into our uh, my Docker Hub. I need to create a repository to store my image. So um, let's create a, a repository. Uh, we can call this image like cater dash in dash action, and let's create. And this image will name by Shen Yu Fan slash Kotlin in action. So that's the image name. So back to the IntelliJ idea, we can um, add a parameter into this. <clears throat> Gradle task. We can say that our image name will be senior fan slash cater in action. Okay, then we will um, run this uh, Gradle task. So you can see that uh, after the Gradle run, uh, it will compile your Kato application and try to pack it using Docker image. And after the image was successfully built, it will, um, it will, okay, we don't have the authentication, so don't worry. Let me log in to the Docker hub and open the Docker dashboard again. Okay, so you can see that I already log in, so we can uh, rerun this command. Uh, there might, might be something wrong. Okay, I, I think there's uh, something wrong in my JDK, but um, don't worry. Uh, if you try to follow the step, you can do the same thing that we, uh, uh, you can upload this image to Docker Hub. Okay, so um, let's do a recap for today's talk. So the first one, we talk about the cutting multi-platform diagram that you can use uh, cutting to develop uh, almost everything. You can develop a, a Android develop a Android app, iOS app, front end, server side code, or a desktop app. And then we will focus on the web development using Cater. So we introduce what is Cater is a web application with a synchronized feature uh, using Kotlin uh, coroutine framework. 
And also we will introduce the, the, the idea of cater plugin that each applica uh, that application code will handle the, the request and the, uh, using the, the handler. That, that handler is kind of the plugin. So if you want to add more and more feature into your Kato application, you need to install a lot of different plugins in your Kato application. So in today's sample, we install three plugins in Kato. One is JSON serialization, one is content negotiation, and one is um, the routing feature. Um, uh, next step, we talk about, about the API design. So um, what the JSON structure looks like and how we reflect the JSON structure into the uh, data class. So we have a, a DTO object, data transfer object, uh, using cutting data class. So we have a product DTO to represent the JSON structure in cutting code. And then we will introduce how to write uh, routing in your application. So you can uh, open up different uh, HTTP method and giving a uh, different HTTP uh, URL to uh, define your application route using DSL syntax. Then we handle the application uh, request and response using the call object. We, uh, in the beginning, we just return a simple, a simple message allocator, and then we generate the fake product data. And third, we uh, store the data into database and um, search the, the, the query from the database and return to the user. So that is the overall workflow that include the, the mock server and Java Faker library, also the expose ORM. So um, I think we, we spent about um, 40 minutes for uh, develop a product API uh, step by step. Uh, you can imagine that if you use Cater to develop a web API, it's quite simple and easy. And you can pack it to your, your, uh, into a Docker image, then you can deploy. So I uh, hope you enjoy this talk. And if you have any question, uh, just let me know and you can type in the chat window. And here is my email. If you have any question and you want to keep in touch with me, then you can uh, write to me uh, by email. So thank you. Uh, so I will temporarily temporary uh, close my slide. Uh, I will jump into the chat window to see if there is any question. Okay, so um, here is the question. Uh, do you have any interesting example of apps that people have built using Cater? Uh, that's a good question. So um, in JetBrains, uh, we say we eat our dog food, dog fooding in our thing. So um, if you head into the JetBrains official website, you can see that we have a new product called um, Space. Space is a all-in-one platform that combine um, all the tools that you need for the, the web development or software development that include a chat feature or Git hosting, uh, issue tracking, and uh, CI, CD, and uh, um, all, the, all the feature that you need for the web, uh, for the software development. <clears throat> and this is kind of the very big uh, platform for the, for the, for the product. So, this plugin is structured by several microservices. And I, I mentioned that Cater is a perfect fit for the microservice because it's lightweight, it's asynchronized, and you, you, you can easy to develop a microservice and pack into a Docker image. So you can see that space is one of the examples uh, that using Cater to, to build a microservice for the product. And also you can see the, the Cater <clears throat> website. And I think there's a lot of different um, CTO or other team lead that they say that 
um, they use Cater to develop their product. So if you are interested, you can see the official website for more detail. And also you can go to the Kotlin Lang official website. And um, for the server side, you can see that there's a lot of case study. So um, as I know that um, many of the case study here are using Cater as their uh, primary uh, framework for their development. So if you are interested, you can um, go to the, for example, to the Expedia, and they will say that how they use uh, Kotlin to, uh, to write server-side application. Okay. Oh, welcome. Uh, is there, are there any features of Kotlin that are particularly useful for Kater's use case? I have no, not used Kotlin before. Um, I will say that for me, uh, if you have uh, some experience from Java, I will say that um, data class is the uh, is a very good syntax sugar for you, because um, in in Java you need to write a pojo, so. Um, for the to, to store the data to represent the data but in Kotlin you just need uh, write data class and set up several parameters for the for the uh, for the class then this is represent a pojo in Java but it, you can imagine that in Java you need to write several um, boilerplate code to uh, represent the pojo so if you uh, didn't write Kotlin before, I will say that you can use a data class in the first time to define the, the data structure that you want to represent. And also, uh, personally, I really like the collection syntax in Kotlin. So you can see that uh, I used that several times in the demo that you just use uh, one dot dot 10, it will represent a list in Kotlin, and you can immediately transfer this uh, list into another uh, class. So you can use this mechanism to transfer a list from one to 10 into a product, product list. So I, I will say that uh, these two syntax is my most favorite uh, syntax in Kotlin, and you can use in the cater right away. Okay, so the, the question is about, are there any performance benefits that come with using Kotlin? Um, I will say that the most benefit from Kotlin is about the syntax sugar. And if you are familiar with the asynchron asynchronized uh, programming, then you can use coroutine. Um, it will uh, reduce a lot of work to handling thread or um, multitask. But Kater, uh, Kotlin will compile all the source code in on J, for, for JVN. So basically it will convert the, the, the source code into the binary code uh, running on the JVN. So um, I will say that it will not much benefit from the, the, the calling uh, in the, the, the performance uh, the, the performance part because it is still running on the JVM. So it's, it's quite limited for the JVM. But if you try Grail VN, uh, I, I'm not sure if you heard about that. Uh, this is a new VN from Oracle. And if you compile your Kotlin code 
uh, using Grail VM that will um, sort of conceptually um, compile your source code into a native code. So you don't need JVN anymore and you can get uh, more and more uh, performance benefit from this VM. So if you really care about, care about the, the performance issue, then you can try this VM. Yeah, welcome. And as you can see that uh, Grail VN also support uh, different languages. So if you, for example, you if you are interested in JavaScript or you write Python or Ruby, uh, you can also use this VN to compile your code to native. If there are no more questions, um, thank you, Sheng Yu, for the very insightful talk. And this will be the end of Friday Hacks 217, and we will not be having Friday Hacks for the next two weeks due to recess week and exam week. So see you in two weeks, two weeks time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. See you next time. <laughs>